Something hit me while we were um, while we were singing. You may be seated. I won't make you stand while I do that. Stand. I do that with you kind of once while the kids. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Get ready. We are kind of awesome. Got to teach them all that. <laughs> um, I'm so glad that's not how the story ends. Since that day, <laughs> sin has lost its grip on me. In Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> In verse 9, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It's not in my notes at all. And it's, I'll try and weave this into what I'm saying today in my message because I think it correlates but the moment that we receive the Holy Ghost, the, the only way that I can think of saying it right now is the deed that sin had on your life. The ownership that sin had on your life. The moment that you received the Holy Ghost, it was broken. That's right. You are no longer owned by sin. True. For human beings. We mess up. None of us are perfect. Even after the Spirit, we all sin. <laughs> sure. But you are not owned by it. So I'll read that again, just to make my point, because I like reading Scripture. But you, you are not in the flesh. If, if you have His Spirit, you are not in the flesh. But in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ. Obviously. You are none of his. And if Christ be in you. The body is dead. The fleshly desires. Should be dead. All of the. When Jesus walked to the cross. He had a lot of. Literal aches and pains, but he had depression, anxiety. I mean, he was human. What would you feel if you had a, a cross on your back knowing that you're going to die on Galgotha's Hill? What are you going to feel in that moment? I, 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 don't, I don't like getting stubbing my toe in my kitchen. And I have anxiety over a broken toe, you know. Don't go to the hospital because what are they going to do about it? But imagine what Jesus felt in that moment. But he says here, but the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, if it dwells in you, if you've been filled with the spirit, baptized in Jesus' name, are living a holy lifestyle, trying to get to heaven, knowing Jesus is much as you can. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. It's kind of like the helium in a balloon that makes it raise. And it's just earthly air. You know, helium it, it'll go out into outer space to let it go. But if you put the air from your lungs in that thing, 
it's just it's just going to fall to the ground. But if you have the life that God brings to you, His Spirit, when He comes, when He quickens you, doesn't mean, doesn't matter dead or alive, you will be with Him in the air. Yes. And that brings us joy. We were talking about joy in the youth class today. And if you don't mind, adults, I'll probably talk more to the youth today just because I'm more comfortable with them. And if I say something that hurts, they bounce back a lot quicker than you do. <laughs> <laughs> At least I got a laugh from it. <laughs> um, my dad used to, you'd be a youth pastor, he, he said that. And I know, um, I know it's hard living in life, and I know that um, life has its ups and downs, but I'm, I'm so very grateful that God walks with us and gives us an opportunity to talk to us, right. not be quiet in this dark age. I appreciate Pastor and Sister Z for letting me come up into this pulpit today. It's a great honor and privilege to even stand up here. Uh, it does right. not make me better than anyone. It just means that he picked me for today. <laughs> All right. And he believes in me. And I think that goes a long way. Yes. He believes in the potential that I have. And I appreciate that very, very, very much. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins. Now, love never gives up, never loses faith. It is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge. All will become useless, but love will last forever. <laughs> Pastor, if you could please pray for the message. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would minister to our hearts and our lives, that you would strengthen us, dear God. And Lord, that we would walk away, Lord Jesus, encouraged, Lord, strengthened, Lord God, and being more like you, Lord Jesus. In John chapter 13, 34 through 35, it says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. I think, I think thinking about the Calvary example, how in the world am I supposed to love you like he loved me? That's, that's kind of hard. You, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If I had a uh, title for my message today it would just be simply love. Simply love. The uni unique value of love, a quote says, from the highest throne of heaven to the most humble dwelling on earth, love both divine and human affairs. So comprehensive is its scope, so intricate its influence, and so elevated its principles that no single person can comprehend its fullness. Yet the most humble person can experience it and receive its embrace. The most beautiful language merely suggests its beauty and power. But the human heart can possess both. Love is the most divine expression a person can give or receive. So my object lesson today, if she is willing to do it, I asked her before service, and she said no, but I'll ask her again. Will you come up here for two seconds? If not you, I'll grab one of your other sisters. So this is love. This is love. <laughs> <laughs> You can go now. I love you. <laughs> Isn't love magical? Yes. Yeah, it is. 
something so complex that even a baby can feel it and understand it. Love cannot be purchased, can't be demanded, and it cannot even be pursued. It can only be given, and it can only be received. Think about that. She did not ask for me to love her, <laughs> and yet I do. I never asked for her to love me, and yet she does. One of the most touching moments that I've ever had as a father was when I first started working at home. Elena, she was right about to go into school. Her hair was messy. We had her PJs on. Crazy hair. <laughs> if I don't do my hair, my hair is messy. So imagine beautiful Elena waking up, probably didn't brush her teeth, going to class. She sat in front of her computer, pushed back her hair, and smiled. She wanted to look the best that she could before she went on camera. Something inside of me broke. Here sat my beautiful baby girl. I didn't choose to love her, I just did. She wanted to, to look her best for those people. But even though she didn't, I still loved her. Every single strand of her crazy hair, her wonderful smile, her cute, cute face. <laughs> Teen Titans references. I realize that my sole responsibility is to make sure that she feels loved coming from me. Right. Amen. Love is greater than all other virtues, gifts, talents, abilities, skills, and powers combined. It is the most wonderful thing in the universe. We may be spiritually gifted or have great talents, but if we have not love, we are, as the Bible says, as sounding brass in the tinkling cymbal. These three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Why is love greater than faith, prophecy, and all the other gifts of the Spirit? Why is it greater than good works, greater than all of our talents combined? Because... All of these great gifts and qualities of character become cold and dead without love. Right. You ever walk into a hospital? You're achy. You're, you're in pain. And as a kid, all you want is your mom. Mom. Mommy. They march into my room at five in the morning. Mommy. They don't even knock. They come in and they say, Mommy. I'm okay. My head hurts. I have a fever that was happening a week or two ago. My throat hurts again. Just get a drink of water. Get a drink of water. It'll be okay. No, I want mommy. You ever walk into a hospital and you sit in the emergency room and wait for six hours? I just want my mom. <laughs> She'd take care of me right now. <laughs> because nurses are great. You're a nurse. My mom's a nurse. A good nurse is amazing. They right. take care of a patient. Yes. They love a patient. CNAs, right. you guys are amazing people, especially if you love your patients. Yes. It makes all of the difference. Have you worked with people that don't love their patients? Oh, yes. I have. Yeah. They shouldn't be in healthcare <laughs> right. because they have no bedside manner and they, they're just terrible at their job. All they think about you as is a, a, a body, a paycheck. Right. Just an obstacle to overcome to try and get to the thing that they want to do that day. Right. <laughs> it's all dead without love. Right. On the other hand, words that are spoken and works that are done with love provide long-lasting effects. Right. You walk into a restaurant 
it's same experience. You have a server that is just so attentive. They're so good at your job. They don't even have a notepad because they know your name. They know what you ordered before. They know what drink that you want. That's they, they just know you and they just bring it all out to you. And I'm really impressed with the ones. I've never been to the restaurant before and they ask my name, they remember it, they they know my orders and that person out, the, the, the server, the bus boy, whatever, brings out your food and, and she comes over and says, yeah, they ordered this, they ordered this, they ordered this, they ordered this, and it's like a party of 12 and they're just amazing at their job. It's because they love what they do. Things that are done in love last so much longer, and I guarantee you you'll go back to that restaurant because they did it with love. If you ever walked into a, a, a place and, and you said, hey, I'd like birch beer, because you can't get birch beer around here very much. If you walked into a restaurant and, they, and you said, I'd like a birch beer, and, and that server said, no, we don't have it, okay? But... They, they, you, okay, I'd like Sprite. So they bring you out your Sprite. And then 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, they come over with a bottle, uh, just a soda bottle of birch beer, and they set it in front of you. What would you think of that, sir? Amazing. Yeah. You'd think they were amazing. How much would you tip? <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> because we appreciate love. And people... Reciprocate love. Nobody has a scientific scientific explanation for it, but a study shows that the benefits of wife kissing are well worth the effort. Based on the analysis of married life insurance policyholders in West Germany, the insured husband who regularly kisses his wife before leaving for the office or plant will, compared to the non-kissing husband, live five years longer, have fewer automobile accidents, be away from work 50% fewer days because of illness, and earn about 25% more money. No precise explanation, but who needs one? The kiss when he leaves is just a gesture? Oh no, it's, it's sunlight for the rest of the day. Two people let each other know the joy of being Appreciated. The kiss is a seal of faithfulness. Any man can face the day better after he's looked in the glowing face of a woman he knows loves him and who pays to him in this simple gesture You are my husband. I am your wife. We have each other. We have a lot going for us. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, words always get in the way. So it's said with just a simple kiss. Kid stuff, you may say, well, you're wrong. Husband and wife not only need to love each other, they need to show it. And they need to show it uh, in a hundred little ways. The bigger ways are not as important. Love thrives on little attention, a little respect, a little praise. A little genuine affection, a little snack together, a smile, or a squeeze. Squeeze. There's nothing lovely as the love that a man and a woman can have for each other. But the modern man is, isn't especially noted for his common sense in the treatment of his wife. He doesn't try to continue the courtship. He doesn't bother to put a little romance into his marriage. Then he wonders why life goes stale for him. Right. So when you're around your wife, men, pucker up. The study shows you'll live longer and you'll certainly live better. And your marriage will be more of the picture of heaven that God intended it to be. That is not me saying that. That is Mr. Horton. <laughs> no, I said it. I said it. <laughs> Did you notice that she put Duke in as her date for the thing? <laughs> no, I when we when I did go to work, I would kiss her every morning because I think that relationship is important enough to put time into it. The power of love goes a far, far beyond just a husband and a wife. 
Children benefit from loving parents. Brothers and sisters benefit from loving siblings. <laughs> They're shaking their heads no for some reason. <laughs> Aunts and uncles, grandparents, nieces and nephews, the person across the aisle, they all need love. But it's very sad that when we say that we love God and fail to show love to those that are closest to us. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, it says, if any man say, I love God and hath hated his brother or wife or husband, child or friend, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? That's true. Love is as strong as death. In Song of Solomon 8, 6, it says, place me like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm. For love is as strong as death. It's jealousy as enduring as the grave. Love flashes like fire in brightest kind of flame. Love is as strong as death. Throughout the Bible, God chose love to bring together a husband, a wife, and their children, and, and gave us beautiful examples for us to see in his word. In the story of Ruth and Boaz, in Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 through 18, and Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, the more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Then she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her. Then she left speaking unto her. Jacob and Rachel. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed unto him but a few days for the love that he had for her. It's only been what? Ten years? <laughs> it's not jokes. <laughs> it was the Jews that cried. Crucify him. Crucify him. But it was love. That, Jesus, that took Jesus. To the cross. To die for his bride. The church. So how can we define, describe, or know what love is? Filio refers to love on the level of friendship or brotherly love. So you have filio and agape love in the Bible. And filio is to have a great affection or care for or loyalty to somebody. But agape is a much deeper love. It is the love that took Jesus to the cross to die for us. And it is the love of a mother for her child. In John chapter 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Thread by thread, Paul examined the individual colors or virtues, virtues intricately woven into agape love. And you'll understand this. Because it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I could speak all of the languages of earth and of angels, but don't love others, I would only be a, a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. If I had a gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge in this earth, would you like to do that? You know everything about everything about everything? I think so. Would you? Yeah. Okay. And if I could have such faith that I would move mountains, that'd be pretty cool. But didn't love others, it would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, if I could boast about it, but I didn't love others, I would have gained absolutely nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. <laughs> Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It, is, it keeps no record of wrong. 
It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, it is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. I'll go on. Love is patient and long-suffering. The word long-suffering means to suffer a long time. Again, I'm speaking to the youth in front, right? You know, those these and nows and long suffering. Oh, yeah. Long suffering means to suffer a long, long, like I'm drawing this out, <laughs> annoying time. But that's what it is. Having or showing patience in spite of trouble, especially those caused by other people. Long suffering. And who likes to suffer? Raise your hand. I enjoy being pricked by needles. I'm not raising my hands, but nobody does, right? Nobody enjoys suffering. We are do, do, we do our best to avoid it. I was watching something the other day, and it, it was this this guy. And all guys do it, right? How often do you go to the hospital? Yeah. Like, if you have an ache or a pain, what do you do? Take a towel on. Walk it off. Did Molly have to force you to go to the doctor? Most of the time. Most of the time. Yeah. Huh? Your injury made, it got so bad that your injury made you go. You, you, yeah, you literally couldn't walk. Give me gummy. <laughs> but that's that's usually how it, it goes. You know, you, you prolong your suffering as long as possible because you, you don't like to you just try and avoid it at all costs, at all times. But how many families or relationships would be intact today if only somebody had loved? Some of you have jobs that go into our community, and there are broken homes and broken families because love just wasn't, true love wasn't there. It was just a fleeting thing, just, just affectionate for a short period of time, but after that, they just separated from one another. But how many of those families would still be whole if somebody would have really loved? Sure. How many marriages would have survived and how many children would still have two parents if love had been practiced? Love suffers long. Right. It has to. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it, he suffered a long time. He wept great drops of blood. He suffered a long time. And his and, and the culmination of it, the thing that came out of it was so beautiful that we don't even understand it. Even today, the greatest scholars in this world still don't understand what happened on the cross. But I'm so glad that he did it. For me, yes. every time I fall, every time I mess up, he suffers a long time with me because I am sinning against him. Love will help us tolerate unbearable people and situations. You know who they are. You know who they are. In Ephesians 4, Chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 2 and 3. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. 
When it's necessary to correct someone, the following instruction is given. Because sometimes, I know you love Hattie, but sometimes she's wrong. You wouldn't believe. It. <laughs> but sometimes instruction is needed. So parents, patiently, with long suffering, correct, rebuke, and encourage your child. Right. Your people with good teaching. Don't just be brash. This would eliminate such regrets as if I only had thought or listened before I spoke, before I struck or lashed out. Love is kind. When your love is present, so is kindness. You can be nice. You can be nice. <laughs> Think about that. When you genuinely love somebody, it's so much easier to be nice. Go figure. Maybe we should love each other a little bit more. <laughs> Mr. Phillips, 1972, translated love is kind as looking for ways to be constructive. This eliminates a spirit of browbeating, mocking, ridicule, or undermining self-confidence in family members. If your only intent is to put them on the floor, then that is not the correct attitude. Right? Looking for ways to be constructive. Construction. Constructive, construction, building. Right? Constructive doesn't mean plow them over and then just walk away. It means building somebody up better than what you found them. Yes. Again, because that's what Christ did for me. The greatest thing a man can do for his heavenly father is to be kind to some of his other children. Love is generous without thought of getting anything in return. Envy and bitterness go hand in hand, and if it's left unchecked, they are like a cancer that will consume the whole body. Bitterness will eat at you, and it will kill you if you let it. I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith be content. Think about that. I just stubbed my toe. And I'm giving you that example so that you put your situation here. Because I know your situation is a lot bigger than me just stubbing my toe. But in every state that you're in, be content. Right? Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. It is not puffed up. It is humble. Love places others ahead of yourself. Love is polite and it's considerate. Love does not behave itself improperly. Love is never rude. It is always courteous. The ability to recognize and allow for another's faults and shortcomings will prevent many arguments and hurt feelings. Love is not selfish. You can never take love. You can only give and receive it. Parents often do without in order so that their children can have. First Kings chapter 3 tells of two women who brought children into the world about the same time. <clears throat> One accidentally suffocated her, her child by lying on it while they were sleeping. And then she went into the other mother's house. She replaced her dead child with the other woman's living child. And then when, the, when they woke up, they realized what had happened. They took their dispute to King Solomon. And knowing the strength of love, Solomon asked the soldier to, think, to bring the, the, the live child over, bring a sword, and cut the child in two parts, and give each mother the other half. But love identified the real mother. She was willing to give up her child rather to, than to see it killed. 
true. Yes. God judges us not only by what we give, but also what we keep. The event, the Son of Man came, the even, the, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to serve, so we must serve others. Love is self-control. Love is not easily provoked. Love is not touchy, irritable, resentful, or easily offended. Love has a good temper. There are two great classes of sins. Sins of the body and sins of the character. The prodigal son may be taken as the type of the first. The elder brother, brother of the second. The, no form of vice, not worldliness, not greed of gold, not drunkenness itself, is more to unchristianize society than an evil temper. When I was a young child, uh, probably about Hattie's age or, or Bella's age, thereabouts, I was in middle school, and I had an art teacher. And I didn't much like this art teacher. I thought he was just a little bit arrogant and proud. And I had an art assignment. And I was stupid. I just didn't want to do it. So I, I did the art assignment as little as I possibly could. I gave it to my art teacher. And he gave me an F. When I got that F, I had the audacity to go up to him and say, why did I get such a bad grade? And he said, because you didn't do the assignment correctly. And I looked at him and I said, have you never heard of minimalism? He called my dad. <laughs> <laughs> And my dad graciously looked at me and he said, you know what? You may be having a bad day. You may be upset about your grade. You may have a bad attitude. But you don't have to prove it to everyone. Right. <laughs> you can choose to be nice. You can choose to love. I did apologize to the art teacher. <laughs> and we had a good relationship after that. But you can choose to be nice. Love doesn't keep score. Love thinks no evil of another person. The New International Version renders this clause as love keeps no record of wrong. They don't keep your past in a book and keep bringing it up again god doesn't do that to me so why should i do it to anyone else this is the concept of forgiveness that we should remember once somebody has asked for forgiveness the slate is wiped clean never to be remembered anymore that's how i am I can't even remember what I wore yesterday most of the time. But Kayla remembers everything. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the nature of a person, right? Some people can. Some people can't. But God doesn't. This is essential if the family and the body of God is to be knit together in love. If forgiveness is absent, whenever stress arises, old stones are thrown at one another. And it hurts. You know it hurts. I know it hurts. Love looks into the future and is uninterested in keeping score. Love hates sin. Love rejoices not in evil or wickedness, but it rejoices 
in truth and goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is not a coconut. You said you'd start singing. No, okay. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control, temperance. I think pastors should teach on temperance. Yeah. I really like the example that you gave me when I asked that question in one context. Mm. But love, the first one is love because love matters the most. It does not rejoice in wickedness. True. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love is an eternal optimist. Love believes the best even when there might be some rough edges or the good is not easily seen. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on those things about the person right next to you right now. God found potential in dirt so he can find potential in you. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. That's what we are. And he found potential in that dust. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. How unqualified is dust? How dirty is dust? But he breathed the breath of life into it. He died for that dust. Love never, never, ever fails. And I am concerned that nothing can ever separate us from the God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. <laughs> and even... The powers of hell cannot separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So I will go back to Romans chapter 8 and say, it is his spirit inside of us. He loved you so much in John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That spirit that now lives inside of you shall quicken your mortal souls, and we shall rise with him someday, because he loved you. Right. He loved you. He loved dust. If we could just stand right now. I know that we can look at this and say, this is, you know, love is love and love is hard and love is complicated and, and love is, is it worth it, worth doing? Some of us may have a problem with loving others just, just for the simple fact that we don't, we look at ourselves as unqualified and, and unlovable. God loved dust. I would bring Elena back up here, but she probably wouldn't. But that's, that's how it is. That's how simple it is. That's how he loves us. You didn't ask for his love. You, you don't deserve his love. Does dirt deserve love? No. But he has washed us clean. He died for us. He sanctified us. And we are going to rise with him someday. Amen. And because he first loved us, I can now love you. He gave us all a, bl a blueprint on how to love each other. 
We were talking about joy today in the youth class. And joy comes not in the pleasures of this world or the things that you have. I mean, getting a brand new phone is pretty cool, but in two to three years when you accidentally drop it on the ground and the glass breaks and shatters and you have to get a new phone, hopefully your plan will cover it. But that doesn't really bring you joy. You know what does? Knowing that there is a God out there that loves you in spite of everything. Everything that I talked about today and, and what is expected of us, he lived it every day. Psalms chapter 103. Let all I am Praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all of my sins and heals all of my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate, compassionate, and merciful, slow to get angry, and filled with his unfailing, unfailing, unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him, catch that, everything before and everything after is for those who fear him, is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed completely forever removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. Our days on earth are like grass, like wildfire, but wildflowers we bloom and then we die. The wind blows and we are gone as though we had never even been here. But the love of the Lord remains forever for those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children. Because I have a relationship with him today, my children have the opportunity to have a relationship with him today. Parents, if you are in this place, you are giving an amazing example to your children about God's love today. Of those who are faithful to his covenant, of those who obey his commandments, he remembers we are only us. So if you feel like you're unworthy of that love today, he's here for you. And all you have to do is raise your hands, repent of your sins, turn around, start walking the other direction, and he will start guiding you into his love. If you have somebody next to you or across from you or east, west, north, south in the city next to us, or if, if you find it in your heart that I don't check all of the boxes that I should when it comes to loving others, and repent. Turn away from your sin and walk in his love. If there's if there's a next door neighbor that doesn't know Jesus Christ and, and they, they have no idea what Christianity is supposed to look like. The body of Christ is 
some other church or, or this world or, or something else has, has hurt them in the past. Be the body of Christ. Be the arms, the legs, the eyes, the mouth that reaches out, makes a casserole, has dinner with them, sits down and talks about their problems. Be practical and love them in spite of all of their inability to love you back. Show them the love of Christ because in seeing you, they will see Jesus. And in seeing Jesus, he will save your soul. Amen. And that joy will come to them. The joy of knowing that even death itself cannot separate us from God's. <laughs> so let's lift our hands today and just talk to God about where you are. You, one of these things has passed, passed through your mind. One of these things has, has maybe convicted your heart a little bit. Maybe, maybe you're, you're just saying, I'm not up to the standard that God put there. But Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Because you 